You're listening to WMNF Tampa, St. Petersburg. I'm Sean Canan, and right now we're joined with the nation's sports editor, Dave Zirin, author of the new book, The Kaepernick Effect, Taking a Knee, Changing the World. It's published by The New Press. Welcome back to WMNF, Dave. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm really gl glad you can join us. So before we really get too much too deep into the book, remind people who Colin Kaepernick is and what he did that inspired the athletes that you interviewed for this book. Sure. But before I do, I just want to say I've always had a special affection for WMNF because my first book was called What's My Name, Fool? And so it was always WMNF was our slang for it. And so the first time I heard from you, which has been like about a decade of you supporting the work I've done, which I'm, I'm very appreciative of giving it publicity and light. I always felt an affinity for you guys because I was like, all right, that's kind of kismity that my first book was WMNF and that's the name of the call letters. Now, to your question, uh, Colin Kaepernick, of course, was the quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers, uh, took his team to the Super Bowl, uh, made a decision in August of 2016 after a summer of police shootings and protests that he was not going to stand for the national anthem. A couple weeks later, that turned into taking a knee uh, in protest. And the protest was against police brutality and racial inequity. And it really meant, you know, using that anthem space be really just absolutely made a sector of the United States extremely furious. They uh, recast what he was doing as being anti military, anti troops pretty much anti-patriotic, you know, people told him to leave the country, people uh, said far worse things than that, uh, including a certain person running for president, which just inflamed matters all the more. Uh, and Colin Kaepernick was then, you know, blackballed from the league after that season, after a really good 2016 season, 16 touchdowns, four interceptions, he was cast out of the league and cast out he hath been ever since. And that was 2016 when that happened. But since then, it seems like uh, and a lot of the people that you interviewed in this book would agree that when the 2020 rolled around and then the entire country was engulfed with these Black Lives Matter protests, it was almost as if Cap had been uh, vindicated. Well, there were a lot of connections, even though he didn't he remained largely silent throughout 2020. I think just one tweet about it but i think that's also been part of his appeal over the last four years that he you know hasn't rushed to every microphone but has remained somewhat mysterious in his approach and actions and aims um and i think that um there were two very strong connections though between what he did in 2016 and the protests of 2020 uh, the first was, as I write in the book, that one of the paths to 2020 was really paved through the athletic fields of this country. I mean, when the movement was on a bit of a lull, it was these young athletes who kept it afloat and kept it in the news. Uh, and in cities large like Seattle and cities in San Francisco and, you know, towns really small like Beaumont, Texas and, you know, and, and Naperville, uh, Illinois. I mean, I mean, really all over the country. And that, that's the range of the folks I spoke to. So that's one connection. And the other connection, of course, is the brutal juxtaposition of Colin Kaepernick taking that knee for peace and the image of Der Derek Chauvin, the murderer, uh, with his knee on the neck of George Floyd. And, you know, it doesn't take uh, an American studies degree from Columbia to immediately click with that juxtaposition. And so you would go to protests, as I did, and you would see signs that talked about, you know, a tale of two knees, basically. So that's the other connection that and that that and that plus the fact that a lot of folks on not not always, but a lot of folks on these protests in summer of 2020 would take a knee in the middle of the protest. And, you know, in some places like Schenectady, New York, the cops took a knee as a way to say, hey, we're on your side too. We want to see better policing, blah, blah, blah. So, um, so th that's the connection. Our guest is Dave Zirin. He's author of the new book, The Kaepernick Effect, Taking a Knee, Changing the World. It's published by the New Press. You're listening to WMNF Tampa, St. Petersburg. I'm Sean Canan. And Dave, the, the protest in the NFL actually didn't start with a knee. It was players sitting on the bench during the national anthem, but then it moved to taking a knee. What prompted that transition? Well, it started with uh, just Colin Kaepernick sitting uh, during the anthem. And it a, a firestorm erupted at, you know, 
this is true. I learned this writing the book, what I'm about to say. We may never have known that Colin Kaepernick had done any of this if it wasn't for a pretty intrepid reporter named Steve Weish. You know, shout out to members of the media who do their job right, for sure. Um, how important that is to like a functioning society. Uh, they, um, Steve Weish had been following Colin Kaepernick's career since he was in college. He, Colin Kaepernick was 29 at the time, so he'd been around Kaepernick for almost a decade. He also followed Colin Kaepernick's social media accounts and noticed that Colin Kaepernick had been in, like many athletes, expressing a lot of frustration with the United States of America at that time, given the incredible immunity that police officers hold uh, when, when there's a killing. Um, and when he saw Colin sit, he immediately said to himself, there's a story there. Even though Kaepernick was sitting on a bench behind his teammates, no one was really paying him any mind at all. You know, it was like nothing. Because sometimes players actually do sit or stay in the locker room, during, even though that goes against the, uh, the financial relationship between the Pentagon and the National Football League, which is very real. And we'll get to um, it. Yeah. And um, a firestorm erupted after Steve Weiss told the world his story about why he was sitting. And Colin immediately saw that this was being recast as being anti-armed forces when it was supposed to be about police violence. Um, and so he spoke with a former Green Beret and a former NFL player by the name of Nate Boyer. And Nate Boyer kind of stepped into history right here in a very bizarre way because he said, well, maybe if you took a knee during the anthem in front of your teammates, it would show dissent, but also show respect. And that'll calm everybody down a little bit. And, you know, that that assessment by Nate Boyer now looks somewhat tragicomic uh, because once Colin took that knee, he learned, first of all, the lesson that if people don't like your message, they're not going to care what trappings it's in. Um, you know, if he had said, I'm kneeling for the troops, it would have been very different. So it's not really about the knee, but it, it is also about the knee because the posture itself uh, became iconic immediately much more iconic than a player sourly sitting on a bench behind his teammates, you know, but proudly on one knee in front of his teammates. I mean, th that changed things. That really did change the dynamics of the entire situation. We're speaking with the nation's sports editor, Dave Zirin, author of the new book, The Kaepernick Effect, Taking a Knee, Changing the World, published by the New Press. This is 88.5 FM. WMNF Tampa, St. Petersburg. I'm Sean Canan. Dave, you spoke to athletes at three different levels of sports who took a knee during the Star Spangled Banner or showed some other form of protest. They were protesting systemic racism and police violence. You spoke to people in high school who had been in high school, college, and professional athletes at the time. And the very first athlete to take a knee after Kaepernick, as far as I can tell, was Rodney Axon Jr. He's a football player. He was a football player at Brunswick High School in Ohio, which was a predominantly white school. So what can you tell us about his story? Yeah, Rodney, uh, I've been in contact with him since the book came out, and he's I mean, that's been the most gratifying part of this project, Sean, is speaking to folks who I interviewed now that the book's out, because, you know, it really take, we really then really talk about what it was like to be brave and make some history, when at the time, all you're really expressing is a degree of frustration at, at society. And for Rodney, he's playing football, and he's around a lot of white teammates who threw around racial slurs all the time. And when he would complain about it, they would just sort of smile and say, but we're not talking about you. You know, we're talking about this person on the, on another team or, or that. And it just, it was really, really hard on Rodney uh, to be in that kind of atmosphere. And when you couple that with the fact that he, like Colin Kaepernick, was getting more and more upset at these viral videos that were coming out. Well, I mean, he's upset about the police killings, but the fact that these videos went viral uh, and then you have to re-traumatize yourself as you watch it over and over again. I mean, it just, it, it was too much for him. And he, like every, just about every single person I interviewed was really marked by the killing five, no, was it? Yeah. Four, four years earlier by, uh, of Trayvon Martin. And so, so all of this was going around in Rodney's head when he, when he saw what Colin Kaepernick did and it just clicked. And that's what I want to get across to people. That's so important. These folks did, who I interviewed, they didn't do it for Colin Kaepernick or they didn't do it to copycat Colin Kaepernick. What Colin Kaepernick bequeathed was really a method 
by which one could protest if one was an athlete. So it's this question of method uh, more than anything else. And, um, and like a lexicon, a language of protest, bringing that to the athletic field. So Rodney took that knee and he did not expect to get immediately booed and castigated from the stands. Uh, you know, that he, he started getting violent threats. Uh, his teammates obviously were not happy with it. Um, and he felt enough worry over these violent threats he was getting that he started walking his elementary school age daughter to school, uh, which is har darkly ironic because the whole reason why his family lived in Brunswick instead of Cleveland, where he'd grown up, uh, was because, you know, his mom wanted him in a suburb where he could go to a nice school and, and not live under a specter of violence. And there he is living under a specter of violence. Dave Zirin is author of the new book, The Kaepernick Effect, Taking a Knee, Changing the World. It's published by New Press. You're listening to WMNF Tampa, St. Petersburg. I'm Sean Canan. Dave, you mentioned the, the case of Trayvon Martin, who was killed in Sanford, Florida. And that's a common theme around many of the people that you interviewed. Maybe it was because of their ages um, when, when their students were, that they say, that many of them said that that's when they really became woke. That's when they started to become activists is around the time they learned about Trayvon Martin. Yeah, I, I mean, it, the similarities that I felt when I spoke to these young folks with the way they would talk about Trayvon Martin and the way that the young civil rights activists spoke about, uh, uh, oh my goodness, Emmett Till. I mean, the similarity is just so strong. Uh, you know, I've seen that on Eyes on the Prize uh, documentary, and I'd seen that uh, with folks that I'd interviewed, some of the vets of the movement that I've interviewed over the years here in the DC area. And Emmett Till marked them. I mean, I would describe it as an all-American trauma, uh, which took place then. And there was a similar all-American trauma for these young people when Trayvon Martin was killed. And that was a revelation for me. And what you said in your question, Sean, gets the point right on the head. Like, if they're 19, they're basically 10 years old when Trayvon Martin is killed. So you're just old enough to be following the news and knowing what's happening and just young enough to not understand why the world has to be like this. So that really, really did mark them. And it animated them far more than the name Colin Kaepernick when I would speak to them about why they took a knee. A coach in Seattle had his players read the third verse of the Star Spangled Banner. It's usually not sung as part of the national anthem. And, and you printed that verse in your book. It talks about hunting down and killing slaves. It says, no refuge could save the hireling and slave from the terror of flight or the gloom of the grave. And the Star Spangled Banner in triumph doth wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Why did you print that verse? And what did how what did these student athletes and their coaches tell you that verse meant to them when it came to standing and saluting the flag during that national anthem? Well, first and foremost, uh, in doing this book, I tried really hard to decenter my own voice and make sure that it was the people I was talking to were the stars of the book. And in that particular case, I, I stepped out of that to print the lyrics because the coach of the Garfield team, Joey Thomas, said that he handed that out to all his players. And so I wanted the reader to know what exactly it was he had handed out. Uh, and it, what it meant to them was that they, as anti-racist people, and I say it that way because the team was not at Garfield is a majority white team. I mean, with a lot with, a, but, but with a large number of black players, like, so it's just a very multiracial squad. And um, it, it, it was an eye opener for them because most people don't know about that verse. And then it's like, you think about how we sing that song, you know, hats off, hand over heart. And we're basically pledging allegiance to a song that that, that talks about killing escaped enslaved people um, as a virtue. And it affected them very strongly. And what it did in that locker room was that it, it, it won everybody to wanting to take a knee together. So it wasn't just a knee about police violence, although that was a part of it. And that's how it started in Seattle. But it was also about racial equity and about fighting and dismantling racism in the United States. A softball player at that same school said, some people don't like Kaepernick 
um, because in, in their times, people didn't like MLK or Malcolm X either because they were helping people and they were starting a revolution. So that's almost de facto, it's going to be an unpopular opinion. Yeah, uh, I, I, the, the, these are incredibly, I mean, the idea that someone could say that at, at her age, I mean, I don't want to tell you the kind of things I was saying at her age. Uh, so <laughs> there, there's just a, a great deal of savviness political savviness in these young people. I mean, you know, they say getting involved in politics as opposed to just study, uh, but actual activist politics is like the best education. And I saw that in these young folks, especially when, because I interviewed most of them before the summer of 2020, but I went back and spoke to them after the demonstrations were in full bloom after the murder of George Floyd. And they, the education they had gotten in the months in between was, was was staggering. I mean, the level of sophistication and how they understood their role in what was happening that summer was amazing. Our guest is Dave Zirin. He's author of the new book, The Kaepernick Effect, Taking a Knee, Changing the World. It's published by The New Press, and you're listening to WMNF Tampa, St. Petersburg, Clearwater. I'm Sean Canan. 